We get to kick off our uncommon uh, series today, and it's going to be powerful. How many of you guys know that relationships that we have in our life, whether that be uh, your dating relationship, your, your marital relationship, your, uh, your chil- the relationship that you have with your children, right? Children, the one that you have with your parents, sometimes those can get a little messy, right? Like sometimes relationships just aren't easy. And so as we go through this series, these next several weeks, we're going to be talking about relationships and what the Bible says about them and how we can get our eyes and our, our lives refocused on what God says about our relationships. I don't know about you guys, but I want healthy relationships. Anyone who says that they're like, ah, you know, it doesn't really matter. Listen, I'd rather save the money on therapy, okay, than have to go through that. Then I would rather just have healthy relationships from the get-go. And there's things that we can do now to set us up for success, not only with our current relationships, but relationships that we have in the future, whether that be coworker, friendships, whatever it is. And we're going to have a theme verse that we're going to be talking about over the next several weeks, and it's found in Romans 12, 1 and 2. And this is in the message version, and we we love how it says it. It says, so here's what I want you to do. God helping you take your everyday, ordinary life. You're sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life. So every day, what are you doing? The things that you're doing. God wants to help you through all of those. And, And then place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. When I read that part right there, it hit me. It got me right where I was. I said, man, where in my life have I just got so accustomed to doing things, to going about my day, to comparing the way that I live my life with the culture that we have today, saying things like, well, I'm not that bad. I, I haven't done that yet. I haven't said this in my relationship. I don't treat my wife that way, right? Like how many times do we say those things? We should not be comparing our lives to culture, but we should be comparing our lives to Jesus. We're not going to be perfect, right? We're going to mess up. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to fall short at times. But the goal is for our life to be a reflection of who Jesus is. And when we get so focused on the culture... And comparing it to that, we can get off course. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quick to respond to it. Maybe for some of you, uh, you guys have struggled with relationships uh, for your whole life. Whether that be a dating relationship, you feel like you just can't ever keep a good relationship. You always get in relationships that are toxic. Maybe it's friendships. Maybe you guys get friendships that are unhealthy, that they're toxic, that they end up pulling you backwards in life rather than pushing you forward. Whatever it all is, all of us at some point in time have fallen short in this category of relationships. And it starts with a base of love. Yeah, it's February. We can't kick off a series in February without talking about love. So my title for the message today is Uncommon Love. And if you're taking notes, you should be because note takers are. Thank you, Valley Youth. You guys are awesome. I love you. You should be taking notes. Make sure you write that one down. How many of y'all love love? Y'all love love. You love the cheese. You love the cornball. Your favorite shows to watch are Hallmark. The big town guy goes back home to the little bakery and he saves the day and he meets the love of his life. Pastor Jason's laughing because he loves him a good Hallmark movie. (laughs) He'll just sit there with a tear in his eye and say, man, the big town guy finally found his love. It's so good. I love it. How many of y'all are out there and like, I tolerate love because my spouse loves love? Good answer, guys. Good answer. Way not to raise your hand. That was real smart. It was a test. Just making sure. But how many of y'all know that the, the movies, the, the things that we watch, the music that we listen to that's all about love, that's not necessarily the picture of love. It's not the idea of love that we should be basing our life on. Because the odds are, if you haven't found the, someone right now, they're not going to probably come from a big city and help you save your bakery, all right? I just want to let you guys know that right now. 
The idea of love, we should not be basing it on these movies and culture and the things that we see because we will fall short every time. We'll miss the mark. We'll think that love is something that it's, it's not. And we get our base of love, we get our idea of love in the greatest form of love that there ever was in the Bible. And it started in John 3, 16. If you've been around church any amount of time, you know this verse. You could probably quote it right now. As soon as I said it, that was the verse that popped in your head. For those of you guys that haven't, that's okay. It's the verse that we get exactly how we should love. It's the verse that we get on why we should love. It's the verse that describes love the best. And it's this. It's John 3.16. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved, therefore he did something about it. A lot of times you'd hear people talk about how love is a verb, right? I think many of you guys are shaking your head like, yep, yep, yep. The verb of the Bible is not love. The verb of the Bible is give. It's gave. For God so loved that he gave his one and only son who died a death that nobody should die. Especially a guy who was perfect. He took a beating and pain and stripes on his back and wore a crown on his head and he hung on a cross for me and for you. I don't know, uh, for those of you guys that that haven't heard, uh, my wife is expecting another baby boy this year. We're super excited. Uh, Carter is uh, super excited. Carter wanted to name uh, the boy uh, Carter Williams. He's been hanging out with his gin gin a little bit too much. Back when Carter was little, they would trick Carter into telling him that his name was Carter Williams. And be like, so I'd be like, no, bud, it's Carter Spangler. He'd go, no, my name's Carter Williams. And so he's just trying to carry on the tradition, okay? We finally got him around to the fact that we are not going to call. I said, hey, bud, uh, do you want to like, call him a nickname when he gets here? Like, you know, he's probably going to call you Bubba because that's what we call you. He goes, well, I guess we can just call him whatever you're going to call him. <laughs> okay, thanks, bud. <laughs> you're, you're good. So I'm about to have two boys. Pray for me. A lot of injuries in my future. But I could not imagine sacrificing my son's For one of you guys. I love you guys. I love my sons way more. Just being honest. And here's God. Who so loved us. That he said my one and only child. The only son that I've ever have ever will have. I'm sending him for the sole purpose of dying for you. That's love y'all. Ain't a Hallmark movie. It ain't the bachelor for sure. It's love. Unmerited love. Love that we did not earn, nor do we deserve. Yet God said the only way that we can have real relationship is through this love, and this is the only way that I know how to do it. Before Jesus, you got to understand, they used to have to take their best livestock that they had, so whether it be a cow, a goat, something, okay, Whatever it was. <laughs> Last week in Kids Church, real quick. Last week in Kids Church, we were talking kind of about this thing, and I, I talked about sacrifice, and this kid, I, I was like, you guys know what that means? He goes, oh, yeah, I got a cow. I just butchered him. Same thing. I, it was way funnier, and I laughed really hard, and don't worry. If you guys don't think it's funny, then you just don't have a sense of humor. <clears throat> uh, just kidding. <laughs> Man, now I made myself cough. <clears throat> But that was the true picture of love, and we had to go before that, and we had to sacrifice this thing to atone for our sins, and you had to make sure that you were living in the law, and you had to make sure that you were doing all the right things, and then there was laws to protect you from from the other laws, and that you had to follow these laws, and God said, enough's enough. It's time to have a relationship with my kids. Whether you know it or not, you're, you're a child of God, and he loves you so much that he sent his one and only son. But what is God's love? What is God's love? How do we actually break down what God's love actually entails? I'm going to move through these kind of quick here. So number one, God's love is unconditional. You can't do anything to earn it. It's just there. No matter what you do, no matter what you say, no matter how far away you run, it's there. 
Number two, God's love is sacrificial. He sent his son Jesus to die in the place of us. He took our hurt, our pain, our sin upon himself so that we can know everlasting life. Number three, God's love is personable. God's love came in the form of Jesus Christ so that we can actually know the person that is love. Number four, God's love is acceptable. Everyone can accept it. There's no caveat with it. It's for you. No matter how young, old, region of the world that you live in, it's for you. And then number five, God's love is accessible. It's readily available. It's there when you need it the most. Choosing Jesus is the only thing that gives us access to God's love. Choosing Jesus is the only thing that gives us access to God's love. We live in a world where we search for love in all the wrong places. That's a song. I don't know who wrote it, but it's a song, right? Okay, thank you. We go from relationship to relationship, friendship to friendship, finding and hoping that someone's going to love me. We search it out. We strive in it. We, we try to do everything. That we change everything about us just so people will love us. But here's the thing. Finding love in the world may bring you pleasure, but it will never bring you peace. We're looking for peace. We, we deal with anxiety. We deal with depression. We deal with frustration. And we deal with an unsteady heart all the time. And we think that if I just had the right people around me, if I just had the right relationships, if I just had that boy that loved me, that girl that loved me, these friendships that supported me no matter what, then I would have peace. That's not true. Peace can only be found in Jesus. That love that you're searching for, that relationship that you're searching for, it may be fun for a minute. The Bible talks about that sin is fun for a season. But it ends up leading to destruction. And the same thing with our relationships. When we look for relationships in the wrong place, we, we try to find love in the wrong areas of life. We try to impress people that could care less about who we are or what we believe or anything like that. And we try to live this life that's impressive and we go out of our way to spend money on people that don't care. We buy things so that people can be impressed and try to get the love. Maybe fun for a moment. We may find some, some pleasure in that. But it will never bring us peace that we really are looking for. The only peace that we can find is in Jesus. 1 John 4, 9 through 17. It's a little bit of a, a lengthy scripture here, so bear with me, all right? But this is, it, it just goes on to talk about how great God's love is for us. And how we should lean into that love to really find the peace that we are desiring, that we are searching for. God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love each other. No one has ever seen God, but if we love each other, God lives in us and his love is brought to full expression in us. And God has given us spirit, his, his spirit as proof that we live in him and he in us. Furthermore, we have seen with our own eyes and now testify that the Father sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. All who declare Jesus is the Son of God have God living in them and they live in God. We know how much God loves us and we have put our trust in his love. God is love. And all who live in lo love live in God, and God lives in them. And as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. How many of y'all would say that in your relationships, you're perfect? You love your partner just as much as they need it, just in the right way. You love your friends the best way. They, they accept it, right? Right? How I many of y'all have ever made a mistake in the way that you love? With good intentions, right? I think sometimes the way that we mess up, it, it starts with good intention. It starts with a good heart. But it doesn't always end up that way. Because we're not perfect. And that's okay. We just had a meeting a little bit ago in our youth group. We have, a, we have a leadership team that we call our varsity team. 
And we were talking about uh, why we're, you know, people are afraid to, to, to see things through. Why do people quit so fast? And one of the things that, that, I, that was brought up, uh, actually shout out Ty Williams, I think he was the one who said this. Uh, but he said that, that people are afraid to fail. And so we quit and we give up. And I think some of you guys in your relationships, again, whether that be a spouse, whether that, whether that be a, a, a friendship, you're afraid to fail. So you just quit. You've given up. You've failed too many times before. And so we think that we're just damaged goods and nobody's going to love us. Nobody wants to be a part of anything that we're doing. And so we just bail out. And we never watch those relationships grow into what God actually wants them to be. But here's what we have to remember. You're not perfect and it's okay to fail. We should never strive to fail, right? Like, like I don't know uh, if you guys have met, uh, really met me or, or, or Victor or, or Pastor Jason, um, but we like to win. Uh, Victor a little, probably a little bit more, Pastor Jason will probably a little bit more, right? Don't play a board game with Victor. It gets a little bit, just, you never know what's going to happen. But we like to win. We don't like to fail. We don't like to lose. But we've got to get to the point where we understand, especially in our relationships, that failure is an option. We shouldn't strive for it. But if it happens, it's okay. Why? Because we're not perfect. We're not God. We don't have perfect love. However, if we can start to lean into our relationship with Jesus, if we can start to focus on Jesus more than our actual relationships, I think that we will start to feel that love that Jesus has for us, and we can then turn around and pour it into those relationships. I can't do anything apart from that. The love that I have for someone is not good enough. Because it will fail. It will fall short. I promise you, I have made my wife mad multiple times throughout our relationship. We don't need to bring up how, okay? It's just happened. I've fallen short a little bit. I can admit it. We're not going into detail. But that doesn't mean just because I failed that I give up on that. And just if you feel like you've been failed, that doesn't mean that you just give up and walk away. There are times and seasons that relationships might need to look differently There might need to be some boundaries put up. But we got to remember this. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son to die for you and for me in my sins, in my mistakes, in my stupidity, in my hard-headedness. Yeah, he still loved me. So if I receive that amount of love, if I accept that, then how much more should I turn around and pour that in to the people around me? It's real easy to judge others on the mistakes that they make when we forget how many mistakes that we've made, yet Jesus still loved us. Just because people mess up differently than you doesn't mean that you're better than them. And the love that we have for others should still pour out regardless of the way that people are acting around us. But we can become frustrated and exhausted and annoyed When we feel like we're going out of our way to love people and people aren't loving us back in that same way. I'm taking a step over here towards you. I'm taking a step closer to you. I'm making an effort here. So why are you not showing me the same thing? Why are you not showing me the same results? I would challenge all of us with this and make sure you write this down. Our first step of love needs to be towards him, not them. When you focus so much on, okay, I'm going to go out of this, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to go, and I'm going to take a step, and I'm going to do this, we fall short of the mark. Again, why? Because we mess up. But when I can focus more on my relationship with Jesus, and I can take a step daily closer to him, I can grow stronger in my faith. I can grow stronger in my love. I can love a little bit deeper. Why? Because I start receiving the love that I need. I start having a whole lot more grace for people the more that I spend time with Jesus. When I'm not spending time in my word, when I'm not spending time with Jesus in my prayer life the way that I need to, can I just tell you guys something? I'm real irritable. Just being honest. It's funny how it ends up working out. I get real irritable and I don't have a very uh, long fuse. 
When people mess up around me, when I expect things to get done a certain way and it doesn't happen, I get really frustrated, I get stressed out. And it boils down to I haven't spent time with the one who refreshes me, who refills me, who I get my love from the most. As much as I love my wife, I cannot expect my life to be that for me. I cannot rely on the love that my wife has for me, which I hope is a lot. I love you, girl. Love me, okay? I hope it's, I hope it's a lot. But if I rely solely on that, I will be disappointed every single time. So I want to make sure that I'm going back to Jesus, that I am taking a step closer to him every single day. Because how many of you guys know that I need a lot of grace, so the people around me need a lot of grace? When we look in the Bible and we see uh, what love talks about, we would be remiss if we don't bring up 1 Corinthians 13. The love chapter of the Bible. This verse, specifically 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8, is, is brought up in pretty much every wedding that you'll go to. Some of y'all even have this written on your walls at your house, right? Like, you, as soon as I said it, you're like, oh, yep, I got that framed. That's a, that's a great saying. That's, that's cute. I was telling Pastor Jason before the service, I should have found the video of it. When I was about 11 or 12 years old, uh, pre-puberty Caleb, uh, I was in a wedding where uh, I read this verse line for line with uh, somebody else that was, that was doing it with me. And boy, howdy, do you forget how you sounded as a child? Uh, I sounded like a little girl was trying to read this thing, and it was the most terrifying moment of my life. I remember sweating bullets trying to remember this thing for this wedding, and I still forgot what I was supposed to say. The person helping, thank God, was older, so they remembered it a little bit better than I did. Uh, but it was just funny to go back and watch that video. Uh, I had, listen, y'all, I had blonde tips. Or I had frosted tips back in the day. Sixth grade Caleb was looking good, all right? Let me tell you. Took some convincing from my mom to get that done, but it got done, and... Uh, you know, I had the Heisman, the girls, you know, at school. I just, hey, not today. Okay. <laughs> just kidding. But I remember this verse really because of that moment being in this wedding. And it's something that I can, I can remember to this day. And I recite. And, man, it just it perfectly describes what love is. If you ever question it, if you ever wonder if someone is, is truly real in their love that they have for you, refer back to this verse. And we're going to go over here. It's... 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8, it says this. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable. Am I stepping on toes yet or you want me to keep going? Okay. And it keeps no record of being wronged. Now am I really stepping on toes? Like who's like elbowing their spouse yet? Nobody? Good. Don't do it. It's not the time for, or place for it. All right. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. Love will last forever. What I love about this verse is if you replace love with God, it's the perfect picture of exactly who God is. God is not irritable. God does not keep records of wrong, God will last forever. Now, like I said, some of you guys might have this verse placed on a wall somewhere in your house, and it's really cute, and you guys walk by, and oh, that looks so great right there, written in that handwriting, and it's awesome. It's one thing to read this verse, it's another thing to live this verse out. It's a little bit more difficult, right? I, I was joking about stepping on toes, but how many of y'all know that we all do this? How many of you guys have ever kept a wrong in your mind? You're like, oh, I'm never forgetting that. You get a little bit irritable with the person that you love because you're around them so much. And you're like, I just need some space. You need to get out of the house. I'm done with you. Right? We get a little bit irritable. We don't always love the way that we should. How many of y'all know that when it comes, not even with just our, 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 our families, but our friendships, our coworkers, this is really hard to live out. But when we do this, when we live out the way that this verse is telling us to love, man, that's when we see real life change happen. That's when we see people who would never, ever step foot in a church, step foot in a church, and then they get saved and they give their life to God. 
Why? Because I've never seen someone hated into a relationship with God. I get it. There's things that we believe in, that we stand firm on, and that we're going we're gonna to preach, and we're going to preach the truth of the Bible. But I've never seen someone say, hey, you're wrong. You need to change. You need to do this. You need to do that. Get saved. And they're like, oh, thank you for telling me this. I'm so glad. Thank you. But I've seen plenty of time people who were loved right exactly where they were, no matter what they looked like, no matter what they did, no matter what they said, and it changed their life forever. Because sometimes people just don't know how to love. People don't understand what love should look like. And so if we're not going to express it, who is? If not me, then who? I want God to use me in, my, in the way that he loved me and then I can spread that out. Why? Because I want to see life change. I want to see people who didn't even know that they were loved realize that they have so much love There's so much the world wants to offer them. There's so much the world wants to bring to them. And I want to be a part of that. But if we don't start focusing on not just reciting this verse, but actually living it out, we'll never see that happen. I've got a couple of things. If if, if we're talking about practical things that we can do to break down this verse and to actually show how we want to love people and the things that we want to do to make sure that people uh, know that we love them, I've got some practical things that we can do. Okay? And I call them my love handles. Because you got to get a handle on love. Not my love handles, my love handles. Okay. Number one, I'm working on it, guys. We're going to the gym. Sung's kicking my butt every day at the gym. I'm working on it. Number one, say it. How many of you guys, uh, it's okay if you raise your hand, it's fine. I, I will, I'll be a little bit offended, but not really. How many of you guys would say that you think it's weird that you, people tell their, whoever they're on the phone with that they love each other every time they get off the phone? Nobody? Okay, good. So you all do it, then that's great. This is awesome. My, my wife and I, every time that we get off the phone, uh, we tell each other that we love each other. Even if we, we work at the same building, okay, in our independence building, she runs our daycare, I office out of there because we do our screen printing, and that's, that's where I'm just at all week long. She's literally like three doors down from me, but if she calls me, I make sure that we say I love you when we get off the phone. It's something that my family has always done. There's never been a moment that I've left the house, got off the phone with them that I don't think my parents have have called. They've been like, hey, uh, I love you. And if they did, I'm pretty positive they called right back and be like, oh my gosh, I forgot to tell you I love you. Oh, that was a close one. Oh. Funny part is when Alyssa started coming around, she was like, why do you guys do that? That's, that's, That's weird, stop it. We like hug each other when we leave the house too. I about fell off this step, good Lord. We like leave each other when we, like we hug each other when we leave. And, uh, and she was like, why do you guys do that? That's weird. Now she's like in on it, it's fine. But say it. Tell people that you love them all the time. It's not a bad thing. Guys, tell your guy friends that you love them. If you don't want to just straight up be like, hey man, I love you. If you don't want to do that, be like, hey bro, love you dog. You can just go on from that way, Okay. But tell people that you love them. Why are we so afraid to tell people that we love them? If it's the truth, we should tell them. They need to know because they may need to hear it that day, that moment, right then and there. So number one, say it. Number two, write it. It can be as simple as a text. Some of y'all people out there that love your emojis, shoot a couple hearts. Love you. Love you. Send a red and a blue heart. I don't know. Change it up a little bit. One of the things that I, I appreciate, uh, that I appreciated back in the day, uh, Alyssa and I were dating, and uh, I had the privilege of going with Pastor Jason overseas to Beirut, Lebanon, and we got to go hang out with George and Ann, who are giving highlight last month. And uh, when I left, uh, Alyssa and I, uh, I don't even know how long we'd really been dating. Maybe it was uh, coming up on a year. Um, but she had wrote me a note for every single day that I was there to open and read and just talking about the things that we were doing. Yeah, we can say, oh, that's good. Oh, that's so cute. Oh, my gosh. But every day I had a note to read, and it was just saying something like, hey, I know that you're you're killing. I know you're doing awesome. Keep up the work. I I miss you. I love you. I'm praying for you. And I've got those notes somewhere at my house. We found them when we moved uh, out here to Grain Valley a couple years ago, and uh, 
I, I've got them stored away somewhere at the house, and I, I've held on to them. And it, just, it, it meant a lot. I know some of you guys like giving cards out to people on their birthday, and you, you write special notes down, and it means a lot to people. So write it down. Share it. Number three, give it. All the people who love getting gifts said, amen, give me a gift if you love me. I love getting gifts. But how many of y'all know it doesn't have to be an expensive gift? Okay. You don't have to, you don't, yeah, I mean, I do love shoes. Someone, I think someone just said shoes. I, y'all want to buy me some shoes, I will take them. Okay. Size 10 and a half. <clears throat> it doesn't have to be an expensive gift. If you're at the store and they've got a drink that you know that your friend likes, your, your spouse enjoys, whatever it may be. Hey, I, I, just, I was at the store and I was thinking about you. Here you go. I was at the store and, you know, I thought about it. Right now, my wife loves uh, Sprite and Raspberry Lemonade from, from Sonic. Not just anywhere, from Sonic, all right? And then you got to get the, the medium, you know, Sonic Sprite, the medium Raspberry Lemonade, and then she does her ratio thing. She, she pours it in there together, and it, it's, listen, she does a fantastic job. I tried it the other day. I was like, oh, my gosh, no wonder you love this so much. Something simple like that. It doesn't take much. Just give it. Hey, I, I took time out of my day to stop and think about you. Here you go. Just wanted you to know I love you. Give it. It's not difficult, guys. This one might be a little bit more. Number four, forgive it. Forgive it. This one's a tough one. You've been hurt. There's things that have happened in your life that have caused real pain. And that's okay to feel that hurt and that pain and that frustration. But at some point, you are no longer hurting the other person. You're just hurting yourself. So we need to say, you know what? I forgive you. I I, I love you so much that I don't understand why that happened. I don't understand why you did that, but I forgive you. And we need to move on with it. Anyone you love greatly you'll have to forgive greatly. If I love you a whole lot, that means I'm gonna have a whole lot of grace for you. If I love you a whole lot, that means that I'm gonna have to be quick to say, I forgive you. This isn't in here, but if you love the person a whole lot, you better be quick to say, I'm sorry. When we mess up, don't be stubborn and let pride sink in and say, well, they deserved it. Well, I said what I needed to say because it was the truth. Be quick to say, I'm sorry. It is not worth it, y'all. Time is too short to be hanging on to bitterness and and, and unforgiveness. Forgive it. Number five, live it. Let everyone that I come in contact with, whether I have a relationship with them or not, know that I love them because Jesus loves me. Let everyone that I come in contact with, whether that be the waitress that's at, that's at uh, El Magwe after the service, the person at the gas station that's taking too long to pick what scratcher ticket they want and all you came in for was a drink. You're like, hey, I, I just need to pay for this, right? No, just me that gets annoyed by that? Cool, thanks guys. <laughs> Live it, have patience, be kind, forgive. Do not let 1 Corinthians 13 just be something that we post about or we share, and it's a cute thought. Let it be something that we live. Why? Because life is short. Uh, mm, my grandparents, um, didn't think I was going to get emotional about this. Um, my grandparents were my favorite people in the whole wide world. Um, and they passed away last year. Mm. And as a kid, I, I loved going down to the farm. Uh, I loved going down to the farm. It was my favorite place to be. Uh, times that my dad and I would ride through the field on my, on my papa's four-wheeler and come back just covered in cow poop. And my mom would be like, what did y'all do? And you know, it just happens. You're at the farm. It's okay. Times of going on uh, walks down the road, we'd, we'd pull up to the gravel road that leads to my, my grandparents' house, and as soon as we hit that gravel road, I had to unbuckle, because I was just so excited to get there. And uh, 
they passed away uh, within the past two years. And, uh, man, I miss them. As a kid, I loved going down there, and I loved being down there, and I loved spending time with them. But as I got older, I took it for granted. I took for granted that they were there. I took for granted that they might come up every now and then and see me. And I stopped going down there as often. Time just got, you know, time just happens and, and things get away from you. And man, if I could go back, I would do it all over again. I would change everything. Because time's short. The Bible says that this life is but a vapor. We're here one day and gone the next. And I'm so grateful. I'm so, so grateful that, that they had a relationship with Jesus and that I'll get to see them again. But there are people that you know that you're thinking about right now that you know that they do not have a relationship with Jesus. So now more than ever, they need to know that you love them. Now more than ever, they need to know that there is a God in heaven who sent his one and only son to love them, to forgive them, to care for them, to bring peace that surpasses all understanding. They need to know that love. If not me, then who? If not now, then when? It's time that we start loving big, y'all. Last thing that I'm going to talk about, and then I'm going I'm to shut up and get out of the way. Some of you guys are in here right now, and you're like, cool, Caleb, I need to love people, that's great. But you don't understand that you need to let God love you. Because you will never be able to love people the way that you need to love them until you realize that God loves you more than anything else. This talk of him sending his son to die on a cross so that our sins can be forgiven, so that we will have real peace, so that we can know what real life is. It's not just something that we say, it's something that really happened. It's something that took place over 2,000 years ago and we're still talking about it today because it's that important. The love that God has for you is so big and it's so great and it never runs out, it never runs dry. And I want to say an apology from everybody else who's ever been in your life. I'm sorry that you have not been loved the way that you should have. But there is a real God who loves you, who cares about you, and he sees you exactly where you're at. And today is a day that he wants you to come back home into the family. He wants to have a relationship with you. He wants you to know I've got a plan and a purpose for your life. That relationship doesn't mean that things are going to be easy. It doesn't mean that things are going to be perfect. Far from it. Jesus said that in this life you will have trouble, but... Take heart because I have overcome it all. So I'm sorry that you have been wronged. I am so sorry that you were not loved the way that you needed to be loved. But God wants to love you today. God wants to pour out his love upon you in a way that you have never experienced before. And all you've got to do is say, Jesus, come into my life. I want to start a relationship with you. And when you do that, the Bible says that there is instant, there's instant forgiveness, there's instant love, there's instant grace, there's instant mercy. But you've got to be the first one to say, God, I need you.